Sciences, Basic Energy Sciences, Office of Energy Research, Department of Energy. Dick, I think you have a few graphics. And the, uh, uh, this is just a sense. 
kinds of, uh, of research of uh, initiative areas or areas in which the uh, relatively high visibility within the administrative product viewing and the uh, catalysis has, uh, um, and so in the past five years, has increasingly uh, asked for uh, more funding than that uh, this is an expectation that we hope to continue. So the message from uh, the, the distribution of the program is uh, the current program is in uh, a book actually which is available. It's an updated book for the audience, a summary book in the form of abstracts. And uh, the current program is pretty well defined. And you can find uh, uh, for your own interest about what it actually is, is specifically being funded. The future directions, well, at least the future changes in this kind of a program, are relatively slow, but uh, are driven uh, not by people like myself, but by the scientific community, both in proposals that are received and in peer pressure to use these proposals. So that the scientific community is, in, in a lot of ways, determining uh, the, the funding that's coming out of the, the energy department, coupled with, with the inherent nature of the, of the mission. DOE has a fixed mission, and it's uh, in a basic research mode, it's rather uh, loosely defined. And uh, so that's certainly uh, one of those things about uh, flexible and moving. And uh, I think that the, all I wanted to convey is, uh, is uh, uh, Bob Marion always wished that uh, uh, on message that this is a, a high visibility, active area, and in no way is uh, being uh, adapted. Thank you, Dick. Now we I call on Farley Fisher from the National Science Foundation. Uh, Farley is program director, kinetics and catalysis in the chemical, biochemical, and thermal engineering uh, sites of the National Science Foundation to uh, uh, let us know his views of uh, uh, what the situation is. Going to enter an area where there's going to be a lot more emphasis on 
low volume products rather than the, the high level body chemicals. And one of the uh, one of the things we like to talk about are what we call tunable catalysts. Kind of a neat thing. These are catalysts which can be used in a single system to make a variety of products either by simple pretreatment or by changes in reactor conditions. In terms of research directions, I I think that Dr. Prismano pretty much set the stage where I think the way research is going to have to go. Uh, I think the era, era when gross measurements really told us a lot about what we really needed to do is over. We need to get down at this point very much to a molecular level and start looking at exactly what is going on with these catalysts in order to really make progress in our understanding and ultimately in our design of future catalysts. I also think that we are now starting to gather the theoretical tools, and I think that a priori theory is going to make an increasing contribution to the field. Thank you, I, I now ask you if you would uh, uh, join your colleagues who will be at the, uh, at the table. And we will proceed. We do have a few uh, written questions, please, gentlemen. Jim. And, uh, the other Jim. Uh, as I said, we would deal with a few written questions, which we've had first. And uh, Keith Fry, Dr. Uh, Keith McHenry, has one here. And I'll ask him if he could uh, read it and then uh, respond, please. Uh, the question is, uh, can you comment on your view of the potential of methanol as a future transportation fuel in its own right? Uh, yeah, I think that methanol uh, may very well turn out to be a, a transportation fuel. Uh, everybody knows the, the chicken and egg story if you don't have a market in the, until you have a vehicle and you don't have a vehicle until you have a fuel and, and those things that get argued about all the time. Uh, <coughs> There are ways to get around this. Uh, many vehicles in this country are fueled in private uh, fueling operations, uh, buses and trucks and taxi cabs and things like that where they don't buy their fuel through a service station and these fleets could be converted. The big problem right now is economics um, and I think it goes back to something that uh, Jim Roth said, uh, that as long as you're going from methane to syngas to methanol, uh, those are going to be, and that's going to be a very expensive route. And if you get anything um, like a market price for the methane, uh, the methanol is not going to be, uh, <coughs> it's not going to be economic compared to uh, liquid fuels from other sources. Uh, if we can break that chain and go through a direct conversion of methane to methanol, certainly that tends to be considerably more interesting. Um, Harry Fry, you also have a, a written question. Would you read, read it for fun? Okay, yes. W.J. Lin of DuPont. I'm assuming most enzyme catalyzed reactions are heterogeneous in nature. What tools are available and how much work is being done to characterize the active sites? Can they be engineered into smaller molecules? Yes. The enzymes are heterogeneous in nature. The catalysis is basically surface catalysis, although the catalytic uh, entity is relatively small as surfaces go, it's still, it is a surface catalytic process. The active sites are a limited uh, part of the total surface of a typical enzyme. The enzymes range in size from about 20,000 molecular weight to about 7 million. The, uh, thought in the field is that nature, uh, that is living organisms, are very highly efficient machines and that they have evolved over a long time to be so. And that if we want to look for the minimal effective size for an enzyme catalyst, we should look at nature. In nature, the smallest enzymes that are truly catalytic are in the range of 15 to 20,000 uh, weight enzymes. Furthermore, studies on a number of enzymes 
have shown that when they can have their structures reduced, usually by genetic techniques, but sometimes by biochemical or chemical techniques, while still retaining catalytic activity, that is maintaining the actual site structure and function, uh, the smaller size often is about that size. Uh, it's rare to find fragments of enzymes that retain their activity smaller than that. Now there are a number of reasons in theory for, uh, that might be advanced to account for the requirements for a larger size. No one yet knows why uh, the sizes of enzymes are as they are, or what might be the minimum effective size. But I would hazard the guess that the minimum effective size for an enzyme will vary depending on the kind of reaction, whether it's a multi-step reaction or a single-step reaction. This is because of the fact that all enzymes have to catalyze, have to catalyze reactions by stabilizing transition states. And if one has a multi-step reaction, there are obviously more than one transition state. And so the enzyme must have some conformational flexibility to adjust to a stabilized more than one structure. This is going to lead to a size requirement given the nature of enzymes and their structures. As for active site, sites, uh, one of the major activities in entomology is to characterize active sites. Uh, this is done by chemical and physical techniques, basically. Uh, the derivatization, inactivation, characterization of products, identification of critical residues in active sites, and X-ray crystal analysis of complete enzymes with bound indicators or substrates. Thank you. By the way, if uh, any of the questioners wish to, to uh, continue the conversation, uh, please come to the, uh, one of the microphones that's in the aisle here. Um, I have an additional question here by from Dr. Norman Parkins, British Gas London. His question is, recently, a joint report from British scientists active in catalysis, both from industry and universities, have expressed disquiet about the relative decline in effort of British universities in catalysis. Does the panel think that the U.S. grassroots support of catalysis is strong enough to cope with the likely future demands of industry. Does the panel think, I repeat the last question, does the panel think that the U.S. grassroots support of catalysis is strong enough to cope with the likely future demands of industry? This is directed to each, each person, but I actually I'm going to turn it over and ask Jim Cusimano, who sees the interaction of universities and industry. The question was, is support of catalysis strong enough in the university to cope with the likely demands of industry? Well, I think uh, clearly uh, there is a, uh, a problem that has happened over the past few years. I think everybody in this room recognizes that there are a number of American uh, companies who have cut their catalyst research efforts substantially. I think also I sense that there has been some amount of uh, decrease in emphasis in catalysis uh, research in academia. And primarily, much of this has occurred, in my opinion, to what I would crassly term a herd effect. And by that I mean, I think uh, uh, Jim Roth uh, alluded to this in his presentation, uh, there are a lot of new areas that have been presented to us, like biotechnology, ceramics, electrochemistry, advanced materials, electronics, etc. And many of the people in this room and your colleagues can make significant contributions. There has been a very substantial movement by industry, and I think secondarily by academia, in order to maintain support, which they get from industry as well as from, as well as from the government, in these areas. I personally believe there will be substantial innovation in those areas, but I think there's going to be um, a retrenchment over the next few years. So if you look at any one point in time, like now, I would say that the amount of research and development effort in catalysis in the United States industry has been cut back, and I, I won't use the word substantially, but I think it has been cut back. I think it will come back. And there are some few companies that are still maintaining it and are hanging in there. Uh, 
there will be over the next five years, I think, this kind of retrenchment. Now, that's not to say that there are not substantial opportunities. And I think we will indeed feel that. We will indeed feel that, unless there is some change. One of your other gentlemen, Kate, would you like to come, Jim? Uh, attempting to respond. Yeah. <coughs> attempting to. Oh, is this on now? It's on. Attempting to respond to the question that was asked. I, I think the, uh, the uh, issue, uh, the question is asked assumes that industry. Is, has demands. Can you hear back there? Which are res which are responsive to the needs and opportunities which the science and technology will present to us. And then goes on to, to raise the question as to whether uh, academic research in England or in anywhere else, for that matter, is is adequately tuned. I think that the, one of the dilemmas that we have, certainly here in the United States, is that the the, the the premise itself is incorrect. I think uh, the, uh, the substantial reduction of catalytic research in American industry uh, uh, raises some very serious questions about uh, of where the uh, future developments and breakthroughs uh, will be satisfied. Yeah, I think the most important thing that uh, was said this morning, perhaps from, from my point of view at least, is what Jim said about who's mining the three tr uh, the one trillion dollar store. Um, there is, uh, if you look at almost any chemical industry or petroleum industry company, uh, they are making money on catalytic uh, developments of the past. They're making money in large quantities uh, on those. And uh, there is still a lot of room for improvement. And I feel somewhat like preaching to the choir here. I think that most of the people in this room would say, yes, we ought to do catalytic research. And the message that we have to get to the management in the chemical and petroleum industry is that there is still a lot to be had from catalytic research. And uh, I will just go back to the example I used in my, in my presentation of uh, uh, you know, we see big savings from a second generation catalyst in a relatively new process. Uh, we have seen big savings from umpteenth generation catalysts in a process that's been here since the 1940s in catalytic cracking. So I, somehow we need to get this message to management that there's still a lot to be had in those technologies and not to forget those while we're looking for the new technologies I just see that uh, basically without much perspective of my own uh, background that uh, there has to be a cycle uh, effect of, of the, the current activities and whatever temporary, however temporary it may be, it will, it will have an effect on the uh, student orientation to, uh, to these uh, train fields that are required. I think that these type of uh, meetings like this and the others that are planned for uh, the few works uh, for the next uh, residents here and so on that um, will have to have a significant impact on long-term problems. I can only say that whenever my management talks to industrial manager, a little closer, please. Whenever my management talks to industrial manager, they get even back in the days when the industry was big on catalysis was that we don't count on the universities for anything, we can do it all ourselves. Uh, and so the American industry has really told the government they don't want anything from them, so therefore, in that sense, we can sort of satisfy the demand. That's not really true, because if nothing else, they do want people out of the system. And I think this is where the country is going to come. I think right now we are going to seriously complete our pool of trained workers and when the turnaround does come, people are going to be meeting the hand. Thank you. Um, along that line, otherwise, I do want to draw your attention to uh, emitting catalysis.
catalysis of the future. Sounds like today, a catalysis of the future, which is being held in Berkeley, uh, state of the art, I, I and EC, July 2021st. Madame Boston is the general uh, chairman, and Professor Gabor Summerjai is the uh, chair chairman right here. You might want to consider that. It's perhaps a symptom of the state of affairs. Uh, and uh, just to remind you that uh, statistically, the Catalysis Society has lost 40% of its members in the last year. So this is, uh, and we turn to a variety of industries who have had their catalytic staffs changed drastically. Many, if most, all oil companies who have had a strong synthesis synthetic fuels group have redispersed those. And, uh, say most, many, all. Um, and I think uh, what Keith McHenry said a moment ago was, have we spoken properly to uh, illustrate not only the past, which is past, but with some ideas as to the future opportunities and reasonable prospects that that might be, these may be achieved. Uh, now we'll go to the last cover at Murray. Uh, questions, comments from the floor, and if you do, please come to the floor of the floor mics and, and uh, make your comments pre identifying yourself. If you have a comment, please, yes. Dr. Erla Cheney. Well, this is from Amico. I'd like to know what effect you think the Pima Tell report is, is going to have on science in general because the report was put together by the outstanding chemists of the United States, and the Amundsen report will come out as the consensus of the problems and uh, view of the problems and some of the solutions by the outstanding chemical engineers of the United States. Are uh, these two reports going to gather a lot of dust? Or are they going to have any effect? I'll just make one comment and ask perhaps Keith to comment. My, my perception was that, that the Pemintel report began a process of announcing what might be done, but was fell short, and necessarily because they were general, fell short of being specific enough to be of interest to Congress and perhaps to industry. Uh, Keith, you're involved with the Atlas report, and maybe you have a deal uh, for can answer best this question. Well, I'm not sure that I can, I can be, shed a lot of light on the, on the process. I know what's going on with respect to the Anderson report, and that is that uh, there's certainly a lot of thought being given on how to, if you will, market the report so that it does get to the right people. It seems to me that perhaps uh, folks over here from DOE and, and NSF might have some comments on the Pimentel report. Has it really had an effect in Washington? Well, the Pimentel report, the issuance of the Pimentel report were exercised a lot of timing. The fact of the matter is that it came out at a time when we had a new conservative administration whose prime concern was cutting the budget, which is exactly the wrong time to start talking about the directions. Uh, eventually, that will turn around. The Pimentel report by then will no longer be fresh, and it's hard to gauge how much influence it will have. Uh, I think its influence, since it has sparked some discussion, not been ignored, but I think it's practical influence as of this point is very minimal. The Amundsen report is also very hard to tell. Uh, its timing hopefully will be a little better. It just may hit a response to the Within my limited perspective again, that uh, the uh, I do believe that the Intel report uh, in particular has, uh, has had uh,
One other point with respect to the Amundsen report, which sort of speaks to what I said earlier about industrial management. At least in one section of that report, we're having some strong recommendations to industry of what they have to do in order to solve some of the problems that we see out there in chemical engineering research. And I hope that uh, we'll figure out a way to get that message to, uh, to industrial leaders and uh, maybe have some effect on, on what they do with respect to their own research program. I'm Ben Lewis from the University of Houston, and I have a question. I think we are here, and I really see here that we have a very exciting time, a lot of opportunities, and yet, if we go now to universities, you find that the fraction of graduate students who are going towards catalysis or reaction engineering is really going down. And I think part of it is really due to the group which is represented by the panel. And these are two. I mean, one is the funding agency. Like, for example, NSF really tells everybody in reaction engineering, get out of there and go to biotechnology if you want to get money for your students. And if you look, for example, in the chemical engineering department, you find more than a third of the students want to work in bio. They don't want to work in a, the traditional areas that, that the better people go. And the other thing, if you look at industry, they essentially are, especially the oil companies, you know, they let go most of the company, the groups which were working on developing new processes, new, using reactors, and so on. And I think if we don't sell, you know, the excitement about potential of what happens here to the new graduate students, you find that in a few years, you really won't get the quality people you were used to get in the past. And I think that's one thing that maybe the panel ought to think about. I don't see you have an immediate solution. I'd like to pick up on a comment you made 
that is that catalysis may in fact be a mature industry. And the other thing that uh, sort of I've uh, been reflecting on is that the real pressures that we see at least at state levels and probably at the federal level with regard to public policy is that, that we're trying to talk about economic recovery, economic revitalization in the development of small businesses. If you look at the job creation over the last 10 years, it's coming small businesses, that is, companies with less than 50 employees. The problem I see with catalysis is how can catalysis create small businesses because it's such a heavy capital intensive industry itself. Uh, maybe Jim could respond. He may be a good example of uh, Jim Cusimano of a small business in catalysis. But it's, Outside of catalytic, I, I'm not aware of a tremendous number of new jobs being created by the whole small businesses. Do you want me to respond to that? Well, we at least have one data point, don't we, George? Yeah, one. Okay. I, uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, innovation does bring about the creation of small businesses and more employment. And I, I don't want to go off uh, on, on, a, on a broad uh, subject that uh, that gets into just the employment issue. But I agree also with what Jim just said, and it really addresses your issue, Jim Roth. And that is, when you create new technology, when you hit a discontinuity, as he calls it, there's a whole periphery of technology and science that's needed. Let's take an example. Let's, let's, let's focus, uh, because I think if we talk in generalities, we may not get anywhere. Let's take Dan Luss's question to the, to the uh, panel. And let's take your response. I haven't seen a new idea. Chemical engineering does need some new ideas. That's true. We have we talked a little bit earlier about um, uh, uh, membrane reactors. Let's take that one specific. That is a new idea. It takes separations and catalysis and other aspects of chemical engineering and puts them in one piece. As that goes forward, we're going to need companies to make membranes. There are a few around, not many, but there are a few. We're going to need companies to fabricate them and then ultimately put them together in modules. That does not exist right now, except in a very simplistic way. That is one example in which a major innovation moving towards chemical reactor engineering with membranes where you can create an infrastructure. And I would propose to you that there would be many of these small companies doing just that. University of Pittsburgh. I would like to just uh, raise this kind of question. You're looking for new ideas in traditional fields, but you're not going to support traditional fields. Okay? Where do these new ideas, where are they going to come from? It seems to me that over uh, the last couple of decades, we've been very much taken up with some new tools in catalysis which have allowed us to characterize catalysis learn more about their structure and morphology and so forth. But we've not done uh, a, a huge job in considering how they work. It seems to me that, that, uh, we, that it's absolutely necessary to keep a certain amount of work in traditional areas of catalysis because that's where the spin-off comes for new processes and new ideas. Uh, I haven't posed a question, but I'd like to know what the panel thinks about it. Mayor Responder? Well, I, it seems to me that, that uh, the choice of problems to use the techniques on is, is really very important. Uh, you know, if we continue to look at just to pick one and like, oh Jim for this example, but if you just if you continue continue to look at uh, reactions of synthesis gas and worry about how the CO sits on the surface and how the hydrogen sits on the surface and all these kinds of things, uh, with all your new tools, uh, what we will eventually end up with is a better understanding of an uneconomic reaction. And so we need people to look out and 
begin to think about what reactions would be desirable to catalyze and then let's use the new tools on those reactions and in that way lead ourselves through uh, uh, Jim's molecular uh, design uh, era to catalysts that will work on worthwhile reactions. Well, I would go a step further, Keith, and suggest that the types of experiments you describe will not even lead to a better understanding of the now that they were this reaction because there's already a good understanding. You have to ask the question, are, is this study you're going to do at such expense really going to add to it? Uh, and in many cases, the answer is not going to do it right. The new ideas have to come from people in the, in the, in the field. Okay, they have to come from, from the researcher who's out there doing the actual work. The researchers who do not come up with these ideas are ultimately going to be worked out of business, I think. And I think that's the way it should be. Well, yes, Jeff? Alex, I'd just like to add to that. And I, I really feel very strongly, if you're talking about industrial catalysis, which I think when it's thriving, I think there, there is, it does thrive in academia, and academia did get support. And right now, industrial catalysis is not thriving like it did a decade ago. And if you're looking for new ideas, Keith, you cannot work, and I'm talking about industry now only, you cannot work just on how a molecule sits on a surface unless unless you firmly believe by knowledge of the marketplace, by knowledge of the product, and by knowledge of the engineering, that you truly are going to get what you want to get. And I think the integration of engineering, research, and the marketplace, and the marketplace is the future marketplace. And you, you've got to get a feel for that. You've got to get out there. You've got to talk to people. You've got to understand trends. And you integrate, in your mind, a lot of information. And those scientists that work in that mode will get the ideas, will work on them, and we'll use these tools in the appropriate way. Now, I'd like to make one blasphemous statement because I know there are a lot of people here who will not agree with this. I, don't, I think it's perfectly okay in academia for students to work on why CO sits on a surface without worrying a bit about where that's going to be used in industry. And I go one step forward, I say they should worry about where it's going to be used in industry because the purpose of academia is to teach students how to think teach them how to do good research. They should not be worried about the almighty buck on how to create a cost-effective catalyst, in my view. And we have a count of hands, I wish you clap for academia. <laughs> <laughs> do we have another comment here? Yes, Jeff? I'd like to look at the, the flip side of giving this one a statement here. And, uh, I have had a conviction for a long time that it's possible to achieve all of the goals and objectives that are normally associated with basic research in terms of learning how to uh, do good science and how to uh, uh, practice uh, excellent quality research and at the same time to be working uh, in, in general areas of focus that have the potential for satisfying the, the, the future needs and opportunities of the area of science and technology, in this case, catalysis that we're, we're, we're uh, addressing at this conference field. And that uh, while these things are never black and white, uh, I would want to like to see more research be predicated on the perspective that we should think about what will the future catalytic science and technology 10 to 15 years from now be and have each of us, whether we be in industry or in academia, uh, think about how that could or should influence the research that we might wish to do. I, I certainly don't want to be left uh, in the position here of saying that everybody in, in academia should be doing uh, catalyst development work. I didn't mean that at all. But. Uh, when you talk about a lack of excitement in the field, uh, I think the excitement comes from working on things, as Jim has just said, that are somewhere out in the future. And if you want to have a bunch of excited students and people who are willing to come into the field, somehow they have to recognize uh, something of the relevance of what they're doing. Cal Bartholomew, uh, Cal Bartholomew uh, BYU. 
Uh, I'm one of these academic people who's been working with CO hydrogen now for the past 10 years and uh, operating under the, the uh, uh, notion or the philosophy that uh, by using methanation or fischer tropsch as an excuse, I could uh, use the, the, this support to do basic investigations of um, effects of promoters, effects of supports, uh, try to understand uh, how the basic nature of absorption with the idea that, that understanding promoters, understanding how CO absorbs on a surface, that this would have wide application to the field of catalysis, that we could build a science that would ultimately enable us to predict how a catalyst behaves and then this would give industry the, the power to design catalysts and optimize catalysts. Now, have I been operating under a mistaken notion or philosophy that this is not relevant to the needs of industry, that we don't need to build a science and an understanding? Uh, I'd like to throw this back. Uh, yeah, I'm playing the devil's advocate. Uh, I would like to suggest that that's not how uh, most uh, new discoveries in catalysis have been made up to the present time. Now, as we reach out to this vision that uh, Jim Guzmano spoke about uh, in terms of being able to molecularly engineer with some equivocation vis-a-vis -vis my description of a priori design, uh, while we're doing that, there are other people somewhere in the world who are going to be uh, producing by uh, perhaps uh, other means, perhaps more empirical than all of us would like, that, that the future advances in the next 10 years. Dr. Gonzalez. I think that one of the problems that we really haven't addressed here, that if we look around, I think we must come to the conclusion that the catalytic community, as it now exists, is, is getting old. Uh, we have been working for a long time, and perhaps our ideas are not as good as they should be. And uh, the question is, how do we replace ourselves? And replacing ourselves is a very expensive proposition. When you hire a new assistant professor and you try and get him going in catalysis, it's become more expensive. It's no longer $10,000, $15,000, $20,000. <coughs> It's $100,000, $150,000. And it just seems to me that it's, been, it's, it's, it's getting a little more difficult for us to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to inspire young faculty members uh, to do research if we, can't, if we can't give them a sufficient amount of funds to, to initiate their research. And I think that this is a problem that the, that the funding agencies ought to address because I think it is from this group of people that we're going to get our uh, ideas of the future. I can make a comment on that which, which relates to um, selling the market, of which I would believe this is part. Uh, uh, Maurice Mitchell is very conscious with the Catalysis Society as well as providing for the discussion of scientific advances is to deal with the health of the community, which ultimately is the health of the United States and the world for that matter. So uh, I think we are having, I believe we have to turn to, to an understanding of the motivations and actions uh, and demonstrating what I firmly believe are great opportunities that will be missed one of the features that I think um, I'm uncertain about has to do with the relationship between government support and industry support, particularly for longer range. Synthetic fuel is obviously a prime example, and I think that we are going to have to return to the time when we have a national energy policy, and it's been it's implemented in some, in some particular way. Just time for one or two questions. Do we have any? Yes, please. Hey, Wolf, hey, Wolf University of Notre Dame. We've been talking about the problems and very little about solutions. 
it seems to me that we need a change in mentality here because a funding agency will not fund uh, the type of research that is very creative. You have to have a safe type of research to get funded. <coughs> On the other hand, the industry, which has a, the market perspective, uh, do not give you the kinds of materials that will lead you to the discovery of, of uh, new reaction processes. Uh, you try to get a new zeolite from this uh, samples of the apple series, you won't get them. Uh, so what we need now is, uh, if we want to uh, have a nice future, as we're talking about here, is a change of mentality for both parts, for the industry, to allow those that, that have the tools to do the research to look on a more basic uh, uh, level, what they've been doing in an, an empirical level, and from the supporting agencies to uh, find more adventurous type uh, Research uh, rather than the safe type research in the public council. I think that's a very good challenge. I think that the industry does need to recognize that uh, if we expect uh, the kinds of discontinuities uh, from academic research that we say we want, we have to be able to be partners with them enough to, to give them the wherewithal to do that. I would, I would certainly agree. I would also agree that the industry. Uh, should be looking to fund uh, some of this breakthrough, uh, far out kinds of stuff, and not to the safe research. Uh, maybe it's easier, should be easier for us to move in that direction than it might be for some of the federal agencies. I have a word. Uh, I had, uh, uh, I've been uh, with DOE for two years and a uh, relatively small time compared to, uh, to uh, well, for sure. Uh, I've been very impressed with the, uh, with the, with the caliber of people in, in the DOE labs that I've done, the DOE offices that I've interacted with. And actually, creative or, or uh, new approaches, uh, one of the things that I typically highlight that uh, there may be, in fact, a uh, little catch 22 that uh, people don't want to uh, make these proposals, but I think they're actually received. positive attitude. I, I interact it that way because I think it's not a, not a uh, there's no fundamental problem. But, uh, it certainly has had tradition and uh, you can see the, the idea of safe proposals, but I think that by and large there's no, I haven't seen the sense of uh, being turned off from the I don't see that. I think that uh, I'm getting signals from our program chairman. Thank him for coming off the time uh, But first, I uh, do want to remind you that uh, the poster session is 1.30 to 3.30, that the wild animal park uh, begins at 4. Please meet outside. Please work, wear warm clothing. I want to thank the members of the panel and the speakers and the audience. Thank you very much. I was very disappointed. I almost got up.